Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the California ISO, I'd like to welcome you to the planning for October 14th, 2023 Solar Eclipse stakeholder, stakeholder Call. My name is Caitlin McGee, uh, representing the Stakeholder Affairs Group here at the California ISO, and I'll be helping facilitate today's meeting. I'm also joined by Jessica Stewart, Senior Energy Meteorologist, John Rudolph, Lead Forecast Modeler, and Amber Motley, Director of Short-Term Forecasting. As a reminder, uh, the presentation and materials for today's meeting can be found on the miscellaneous meeting webpage under the Stay Informed tab. Next slide, please. Before we get started, a few housekeeping reminders today. Um, this call is being recorded for informational and convenience purposes only. Any related transcription should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. These are collaborative meetings um, and intended to stimulate dialogue and different perspectives, but we do ask that you keep your comments professional and respectful and to uh, try to refrain from repeating what has already been said. Next slide. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment during today's meeting, there is a, a few ways you can do that. Um, if you're connected to audio using your computer or using the Call Me option in the WebEx platform, you can select the raise hand icon in the bottom right toolbar. If you're connected through an audio only line, you can click pound two, that'll add you to the queue. And if you prefer, you can uh, send your comment or question into the chat box and I'll read it aloud for you. Please remember to state your name and affiliation before making your comment or asking your question. And if you need any technical assistance during today's meeting, you can send a chat to the event producer. Next slide. Uh, so for today's meeting, we have um, a pretty full cool agenda. We're gonna go over some um, overview on the eclipse, the impacts uh, to CAISO, uh, WEIM impacts, grid protections, and uh, a bit on our timeline at the end of today's presentation. Uh, so with that, we'll move to the next slide and I will hand it over to Jessica Stewart. All right, good afternoon everybody. And as Caitlin mentioned, my name is Jessica Stewart and I am the Senior Energy Meteorologist here at the California ISO. So just wanted to start with a little bit of an overview of the eclipse that we will be seeing on Saturday, October 14th. The impacts to California will be approximately from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. with a full path shown over here on the graphic on the right. Um, this is an annular eclipse. It is different than the total eclipse that we had in August of 2017. That was a total eclipse, which mean that meant that the um, sun was fully covered by the moon. This is an annular eclipse, meaning that the sun won't fully cover the moon. We'll get sort of that ring of fire effect that you can see here in the image on the bottom left um, underneath that annular name. Um, at this, with this eclipse, the sun will be maximally obscured by about 90% across most of the West. Um, so instead of a path of totality, we'll have a path of annularity, but we'll still see pretty similar effects across that path. Um, with the largest impacts, mainly being across Oregon, Nevada, and Utah, and New Mexico for the largest um, distances of that total um, path of annularity. But other locations across much of the West, such as California, will also see pretty large impacts of the eclipse as well. Next slide, please. So just a quick comparison of the 2017 eclipse, which was on August 21st, 2017, to the one we're expected to have on uh, October 14th of this year. You can see the paths are similar and that the largest impacts are across the Western United States. Um, this one does take more of a direct effect path across the desert Southwest and into Texas, whereas the previous eclipse in 2017 um, sort of went more across the central United States and exited off of the um, coast of South Carolina and the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so we will we'll have a little bit more of a, uh, I guess, direct hit from this one across more of the Western states than we did with the eclipse in 2017. At the bottom here, we are doing a comparison of the growth of the grid scale and behind the meter solar across KISO in blue, and then the EIM entities in green. So in 2017, the KISO grid scale solar was only about 10,000 megawatts. 
Now in 2023, six years later, we've got a little over 16,500 megawatts of grid scale solar, so quite a large increase in that. We also saw about 8,650 megawatts of growth of KISO behind the meter solar um, or rooftop PV across the state as well. And then for our EIM entities, also very large increases. Um, at the time of the last eclipse in 2017, we only had about four EIM entities, and now we've got 21. So much, much more EIM um, footprint across the West, which is leading to this large increase in our grid scale and behind the meter solar. So our grid scale solar for EIMs increased almost by 9,500 megawatts, and our behind the meter solar across the EIMs increased by over 5,700 megawatts. Um, so, given that the path is a little bit more direct across more western states, we have a much larger EIM footprint, and then the grid scale and behind the meter solar across both KISO and EIM has grown. Um, we're expected to see m more of an impact uh, across the west from this eclipse um, from the KISO perspective than we did with the previous one. Next slide, please. So just kind of doing an overview of the eclipse impacts that we saw in 2017. Um, these were posted to the KISO website after the eclipse occurred. The top here is the renewables trend. The yellow line is the solar output that we had on August 21st of 2017. And then the light blue line there at the bottom is the wind. And then in the bottom left, we have our load impacts. Um, the, the net load is shown in green. And then the standard load is shown in the, the blue color. So you can see the impact that we had for both the um, regular load and the net load um, throughout the eclipse, time, eclipse times, as well as the impact that we had to solar in the top right as well. So on that day, we saw about a 6,000 megawatt reduction in our solar generation during the eclipse time compared to a clear day. This eclipse occurred from about 9 a.m. to noon, so pretty similar timing. Um, as the 2023 20, eclipse, which will be from about 8 to 11 a.m., just shifted a little bit earlier. So it's nice that we have that kind of on-ramp solar comparison from 2017 to now. Um, 2017, the, minim, the ramp down saw about a minus 50 megawatt a minute decrease in solar while the ramp back up after the eclipse maximum occurred and the sun was starting to come back out. We saw solar increase. Um, at a quicker rate of about 77 megawatts a minute. On that day, we did reach a solar minimum of 2,845 megawatts, which as I mentioned was about a 6,000 megawatt reduction compared to a clear day for solar generation. Moving over to the load side, uh, we saw about uh, when the eclipse, eclipse was starting, going into its maximum, we saw about a 1,900 megawatt increase in load. And then after the eclipse maximum and the sun started to come back out, we saw a load drop by about 16,000 or 1,650 megawatts. Um, throughout that time, we had a net load increase of about 5,500 megawatts. Um, and just as a reminder, net load is load minus wind minus solar. So um, that does include that impact that we had from that large solar decrease that we had in there for the net load as well. All right, next slide, please. So shifting back over to the 2023 eclipse and what we're expected to see um, on the next couple of slides, I'll talk about both the regional and grid scale solar impacts that were expected to have from this eclipse across the KISO BAA. So I just wanted to point out some of the locations that we have for our general regional solar, um, since they are pretty scattered across the state, both um, north, south, latitude, longitude wise, but also relative to where they're located to this path of annularity for the eclipse. Um, so our most northern sites are then in the northern San Joaquin Valley, um, generally kind of spread out across the greater Sacramento area. We also have a large number of sites in the southern San Joaquin Valley. Um, and then down into southern California, um, where the majority of our grid scale solar is located in the deserts, um, expanding from the Mojave Desert region down to the um, Imperial Coachella deserts, and then also over into the Arizona and Nevada borders. Um, we have a bit, quite a bit of solar out there as well. So depending on the latitude, longitude, and how close they are to the path of annularity with the eclipse, we'll see varying degrees of impacts across all these different regions. Next slide, please. So 
Uh, this table is kind of the overview of what we're expected to see in terms of when the eclipse will start for each region, the time that the eclipse will see its maximum for each region, and then also the time the eclipse will end. You can see that beginning in the northern San Joaquin sites, the furthest north, our, the eclipse will begin around 8.05 a.m. And then down in Southern California for the sites over near the um, California-Arizona border in the Yuma region, the eclipse will end at about 10.57. So um, that's where we're getting that um, 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. time frame. Um, and then as we go from north to south, the eclipse starts earlier in the northern locations, closer to the path of totality or the path of annularity, and then down in Southern California, it starts a little bit later, closer to 810. The time of the eclipse maximum ranges from about 920 in the morning for the northern San Joaquin sites down to 930 or 929 for the Yuma sites in the southern region. And then the end time also varies from about 1043 for the northern sites to 1057 for the southern sites. The amount that each region will have its, the sun obscured and its solar output affected um, um, sorry, I thought I heard someone. Um, so the amount that the each site and region will have the sun obscured also varies. Um, the site with the maximum effect is going to be the Southern Nevada sites. They're a little bit further to the east and closer to that path of totality. And then the sites that will have the least amount of impact will be the LA Basin and Coachella or Imperial Valley locations. Um, they're just a little bit further south and west, so not as close to that path of annularity and won't have as much of a impact to their generation, but um, still quite large. So um, looking at the kind of the sections on the right of the table, um, what we did was we calculated the approximate generation um, of the regions at the start of the eclipse. Um, so this would be the beginning before the eclipse really has taken effect. Um, you can see if you add up the total um, megawatt output across the different regions before the eclipse starts, our solar output will be about 6,300 megawatts. Um, then in the middle, the darker gray shading, we take the um, obscuration of the sun for that given time frame um, for each region, um, multiplied it by the, the capacity and the expected generation that we're expected to have, um, assuming a clear sky for that day, and came up with a um, number of about 3,000 or so megawatts for the system-wide KISO number in terms of the amount of um, output that we're expected to have at the eclipse maximum. And I'll note that these are at the given time. So for example, the Northern San Joaquin site max time is 920. So that 38 megawatts for that region is at 920 versus Yuma down in Southern California, that 202 megawatt number is from the 929 maximum. So um, this is kind of like the minimum staggered across all the different uh, eclipse maximum times to get that 3000 megawatt number. And then after the eclipse ends, we'll rebound to about 13,000 or so um, megawatts. Uh, and given that it's October, we're, uh, you know, we have 16,500 megawatts of capacity, but it's October, it's October headed towards the, the winter time and, um, you know, lower sun angles and generally just less daylight. So that's why our solar output at the end of the eclipse is um, a bit reduced off the, the capacity of the site. Next slide, please. So this is just sort of a graphical impact of everything I mentioned on the last slide, but sort of summed up at the system-wide level. Um, and the on this graph here, all of the blue lines and blue numbers are a clear sky solar day, and all of the orange lines and orange numbers are the approximate reductions or ramp rates um, for the solar resources um, on the eclipse day. So going through the morning, the eclipse starts around 8 o'clock. Um, we do see a little bit of an increase and the solar generation, um, that kind of first initial peak before it dips out into the minimum, um, that's because even though the sun is starting to be obscured by the moon, um, we will actually start to, the sun will still continue to rise in the sky and it'll lead to a little bit of an increase in generation um, with the, that little local maximum there at about 8.30 in the morning before we really start to see our decrease in solar. Um, so we'll go from, um, that little 
maximum peak around 830 down to our minimum solar generation around 930 in the morning before we then have that ramp up from about 930 in the morning to 11 o'clock. From about 830 to 930, we'll see our solar decrease by about 85 megawatts a minute and lose about 5,000 megawatts of generation during that hour. And then, um, I'm sorry, that 5,000 number is the, yeah, that's correct. Um, and then from eight, at 930, we will see our solar minimum of about 3,200 megawatts, which is a difference of 9,687 compared to a clear sky day. Um, so the 2017 eclipse, we saw about a, re a reduction of about 6,000 megawatts. With this eclipse, we're expected to see closer to about 96, 9,700 megawatts of reduction from the solar. And then for the 9.30 to 11 o'clock period, when the sun is coming back, we'll see about 10,800 megawatt increase, which is about 120 megawatts a minute for that 9.30 to 11 o'clock period. Um, on a normal day, we see this ramp rate is about 12 megawatts a minute from 9.30 to 11 o'clock in the morning. So it's about 10 times larger on this eclipse day compared to a normal non-eclipse day from that 9.30 to 11 o'clock that we will see um, when the sun comes back out. And next slide, please. Um, one of the other things to consider as so they're sort of shifting away from the solar piece of it is the considering the effects of temperature and wind. Um, obviously, with the sun going away, we won't see as much um, heating from the sun so that will have an impact of the temperature. Uh, we looked at several studies, both over um, the, the UK, which um, has uh, had a couple of eclipses recently where they did impacts on temperature and wind, and then also from the 2017 eclipse, various stations across the United States um, did an approximate reduction in their temperatures from what they saw from that eclipse. And we saw that depending on the different obscuration levels and how long and how uh, much the sun goes away leads to effects on different temperature effects um, throughout the eclipse. So um, if the sun was obscured 60%, areas saw about a two degree temperature reduction. Uh, areas that had a 60 to 80% obscuration had about a two to four degree temperature reduction. And then areas 80 to 100% obscuration had about a six to eight degree temperature reduction. Um, and much of California in this one is closer to that um, either 80, 80 to 90 percent range um, for parts of California or that 60 or 70 to 80 percent range. So in general, I would suspect that we will probably see about a four to six degree temperature reduction across most of California from this event. Um, so that's another piece to consider when, when doing all of these different um, pieces of how it will affect the solar generation and the load output as well. Another piece that was um, is worth considering is the wind effects. Um, also, depending on the obscuration level, you could see a potential reduction in the wind speed, which could then also lead to a reduction in the wind generation output as well. Um, there aren't as many studies on this. The 2015 eclipse in the United Kingdom, they did see about a two to six reduction in two to six mile per hour reduction in their wind speed, which led to about a 10% reduction in their wind generation output. However, since most of California, especially where a lot of our wind sites are located, will be closer to that 65 or that 70 to 80% reduction, um, I don't think we'll see a 10% decrease in the wind output on that day. Um, however, it is something that we will be monitoring as we get the forecasts in and, and kind of see where the um, wind output is as we approach October 14th in terms of the effect that it could have on the wind output as well. And I will stop there and see if there are any questions about the effects to solar or temperature and wind. Again, if you want to ask a question or make a comment, you can click the raise hand icon at the bottom um, right toolbar or drop your comment or question into the chat and I can read it aloud. Um, but at this time, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Okay. Awesome. Well, with that, I will pass it over now to John, who will go over the impacts to load. Hi, everybody. My name is John Rudolph. I'm a lead model on the short-term forecasting team. Let's go to the next slide, please.
So we did model the eclipse impact to KISO load. The KISO load models account for behind the meter solar generation, which is the primary driver of the eclipse related impacts. Similar to grid scale solar, which Jessica just talked about, BTM generation will also decline during the eclipse obscuration periods. Um, to model the eclipse impact on weather, there's also two key weather related assumptions that we need to make. Um, one is we assume that there'll be clear sky conditions on the eclipse day. And two, um, we assume that October weather will be normal, meaning um, relatively mild temperature conditions. Um, because of the clear sky assumption, um, the results presented on load should be viewed as more of a high impact type of scenario. The graphic on this slide shows load on the eclipse day, which is in orange relative to a clear sky day, which is in blue. Um, you can see that load will follow the typical morning peaking pattern. Um, as the eclipse starts, BTM solar generation will start to decline. This causes a second um, peak in the morning will load will increase by about 2,374 megawatts. As the eclipse begins to wane and BTM generation returns, this will cause a pretty steep sh sharp drop off in load of about 6,664 mega 6,643 megawatts as load returns to the afternoon trough. <clears throat> The eclipse will also occur on a Saturday, which is when load low levels are generally lower um, relative to weekday conditions. Next slide, please. So this uh, slide is really just showing a zoomed in um, version of the graphic that was on the previous uh, slide. It's designed to highlight the load ramping requirements during the uh, key uh, eclipse periods. The ramp up and load will begin at 8.15 a.m. Um, load will increase during this period by 2,374 megawatts, which is an average ramp rate of about 40 megawatts per minute. At 9.15 a.m., eclipse reaches its maximum obscuration, and then on the eclipse return, load will sharply drop by 6,643 megawatts, which is an average ramp of minus 74 megawatts per minute. Then the tables below the graphic are just reporting key statistics over the um, eclipse uh, ramping period. Next slide, please. This is a similar graphic as the previous slide, but now we're showing net load. And so net load is the difference between the KISO BA load and the grid scale renewable generation. Timing of the eclipse is the same as it was shown on the previous slide, but the magnitude and ramp rates are higher since net load reflects the combined impacts of the drop in renewables generation and the increase in gross load. The net load ramp up is going to be 2000 or 7,294 megawatts, which is about 122 megawatts per minute on average. And then during the, the ramp down period, load net load will drop by about 17,134 megawatts, which is about 190 megawatts per minute on average. Next slide, please. This graphic compares the ramp rates during the eclipse period to actual ramp rates that have been experienced to date in 2023. What we can see is that during the up ramp period, the ramp rates are similar to some of the steeper ramps that we've experienced during the evening peaking period so far in 2023. On the ramp down period, those are the ramp rates which are gonna be steeper and a little bit more unusual where some of the ramp rates on the down ramp could be up to 100 megawatts steeper than those experienced so far in 2023. Next slide, please. To summarize the key points for the eclipse impacts on both grid scale solar and load. For grid scale solar, there'll be a loss of about 5,068 megawatts from the eclipse start to the eclipse maximum, and then an increase of about 10,800 megawatts from the eclipse maximum to the eclipse end. For gross load, there'll be an increase of 2,000 374 megawatts from eclipse start to the eclipse maximum, and then a decrease of 6,000 643 megawatts from the eclipse maximum to the eclipse end. Finally, for net load, there'll be an increase of 7,000, 
294 megawatts from the Eclipse start the Eclipse maximum, and then a decrease of 17,134 megawatts from the Eclipse maximum to the Eclipse end. Next slide, please. So we also performed an analysis on the Eclipse impacts across the WEIM put footprint. As mentioned before, there's 21 BAs that participate in the WEIM. Most of the WEIM entities self-submit their renewable forecasts, and the CAISO is working with the WEIM entities to ensure appropriate accounting for Eclipse impacts in these submittals. The, the ISO does serve as the load forecast provider for most WEIM participants. And we have modeled eclipse impacts to WEIM loads in a similar fashion that we just walked through on the CAISO um, in the previous slides. Um, the major, this modeling is primarily based on changes in levels of BTM solar generation, similar to CAISO. Next slide, please. There are sizable amounts of both grid scale and BTM scale or BTM solar capacity installed across the WEIM footprint. This table has a breakdown um, for each WEIM region and participant. A few items to highlight. The, the central WEIM region has the most installed grid scale solar capacity, and the desert southwest has the highest amount of BTM solar capacity. And then um, the Pacific Northwest has the lowest amounts of both grid scale and BTM scale solar capacity. Generally, we expect the eclipse impacts to vary with levels of installed um, BTM solar capacity um, from a load perspective. Let's move to the next slide, please. So this graphic shows the WEIM impacts to aggregate regional loads. Um, so these uh, include, um, these are based on the, the mappings from the previous slide. The largest impact is in the desert Southwest where reductions in BTM output will push the, eight, the morning peak up by about 18% relative to a clear sky day. There's also, also sizable impacts in California and the central regions of 9.6 and about 5.9%. And then there's more of a muted impact in the Pacific Northwest region with loads only increasing about 2.3% relative to a clear sky day. Similar to the modeling that we showed for CAISO, these results should be interpreted as, as more of a high impact scenario since the modeling assumptions are based on clear sky conditions. That is the end of the eclipse portion. I am gonna hand it off to Amber, but I'll see if there's any questions. don't have any hands raised. Um, we did have a question from Mark Smith with Calpine. How will these ramps affect outage uh, maintenance scheduling for non-solar resources? And I can touch base on that one um, in the next couple of slides when we talk about market related planning items. Okay, and then we did just get a hand up. Uh, Paul Nelson with Customized Energy Solutions. Go ahead. Yes, um, hope people can hear me okay. Yes. Can, okay, thank you. So uh, slide 15, you had a chart showing your forecasted ramp rates in comparison to what you've experienced in 2023, and it, and it shows that these ramp rates are higher yeah. than what you've observed. And my question is, is, do you foresee this being a problem in dealing with the ramping rate caused by this eclipse, or, the, or do you believe there's enough resources to manage uh, the ramping rates? Yeah, John, I can take Yeah, did we want to go back to the, the slide where the, the question was on? Yeah, sure, we can go back to slide 13. Would that be? Uh, yeah. yeah. We're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit in the next few slides as well as the operational section um, about some of the mechanisms that we're going to use during the eclipse to assist with the larger ramps that are anticipated. Um, so it might be helpful to answer that question as well as the outage 
question after we get through um, the next few slides. Okay, I'll look forward to the explanation. Thank you. All right, well, I think that's all we have for questions at this time. All right, well, it sounds like everybody wants to dig a little bit into what are we going to do because we have a big ramp. All right, so if we can go to slide 18, um, this is Amber. I'll talk a little bit about some of the market mechanisms and planning um, items that we will be doing um, to help assist with the change in the solar fleet, both on the grid scale as well as the rooftop solar, um, in addition to um, the potential impacts to um, the ramps that were mentioned. I think it's two more slides forward, sorry. Yeah, sorry, we have a couple of slides, so slide 20, please. There we go. All right, so this looks very similar to some of the market mechanisms that were used during this planning for the 2017 solar eclipse as well. Um, that um, eclipse was well handled um, when going into the planning horizon. There was a lot of coordination um, in submittal of information, et cetera, done pre-eclipse. Um, so you're going to see the same type of coordinations occurring, right? We're going to coordinate with the IOUs, the WEC and the RC West, um, the adjacent BAs, the WEIM footprint, um, in addition to running some internal market simulations. As you guys have seen, this eclipse impact is bigger than what we felt in 2017. Um, but the reason and the cause that's driving this one to be bigger than what we saw in 2017 is really the amount of solar growth that we have um, within California, the Western EIM, on both the grid scale as well as the behind the meter solar. Um, so the growth in those areas has really, even though this is not a total eclipse, and this is an annual eclipse, sees the ramp rates and the movement um, from 2017 to this one to be larger. So it's gonna be really important to have that forward coordination. So Mark was asking a question about outage maintenance coordination. We are gonna look at the outages um, on both the transmission and the generation side that are scheduled for October 14th. It's a little different than what happened during the August eclipse, right? We, have, we are in outage season a little bit more during October than we are in the August time period. We may issue what we call a restricted maintenance operations for that day, but we won't do that until we get a little bit closer into real time um, within the day plus seven horizon as we're running some of these simulations and the 48 hour reliability unit commitment runs, et cetera, and we can kind of see how everything is coming in. We start getting all of the forecast information for the weather, the renewables, um, within that seven, eight day horizon. Um, so then we're really gonna lean on those runs to help inform um, the actions that are taken, but it is a potential action um, that we're looking at of doing an RMO for that time period, depending on the conditions that are there. There's other new things on here um, from lessons learned um, from the 2017 eclipse, also just new market features, right? So the minimum state of charge is mentioned on here. We have a significantly larger battery fleet than we had in 2017. Um, so there may be resource optimizations that are taken with the battery fleet as well as the hydro fleet to help prepare for such a large ramp um, that is known in advance. Um, and, and one of those might be the minimum state of charge as well. In addition, we have the assistance energy transfer opt-in um, for the WEIM footprint to be able to utilize. Um, that is also a tool in the toolbox um, that will be looked at that is new this time around versus in the 2017. There's other things throughout here um, that are talking about the potential you know, use of flex or demand response. I, I will note that was something that was also in the potential for 2017. That was an August time period. It's still in the toolbox, but this is October, um, so we are keeping that in mind as well. We don't typically have quite as high of load conditions during the October timeframe as we do have during August. Um, in addition, we have the WEIM transfer capability. Um, when we went through the 2017 eclipse, we had four WEIM entities, and we have now 22. Um, so the use of that and knowing that the eclipse is moving throughout the West for a period of time 
will really help uh, assist in using the WEIM transfer capacity across the West to really have differences in when the max obscuration is in the Pacific Northwest dirt versus the desert Southwest. And that leads really to the importance of the forecasting. So it is important that the day ahead and multi-day forecasting for the solar resources um, is really captured so that you can see that in all of the planning targets. Um, so for the WEIM entities that submit um, their own forecast for their solar resources, we'll be working and coordinating with them on the importance of it. Also for those that are scheduling in to the day ahead market, the solar um, forecast is really critical to take into account the solar eclipse and the obscuration rates into your solar forecast. So to ensure you're coordinating with your vendors or your in-house um, to be able to make that happen in those forward time periods to plan for. And uh, last, we will have conference bridges open um, and then a post conference bridge as well. And we will write up some thoughts and facts that we've seen as we get through the different eclipse. And with that, I'm gonna pass the presentation over to I believe Brian or Michael, and they're gonna dive into these a little bit more from an operator perspective as we start planning the different horizons on the operation side. Sounds good, thanks, Amber. If you could advance to the next slide. Yeah, the first introduction, sorry about that. Um, I'm Brian Murray, the Manager of Market Operations Coordination, and I've been working uh, quite closely with Michael Martin. He's a Senior Advisor in System Operations. Um, I report directly to Dave Del Part, the Director of Real-Time Ops, and obviously John Phipps, our Executive Director in, in Grid Operations. We're all um, been discussing you know, our plans a lot for this upcoming eclipse talking about our lessons learned from uh, back in August of 2017, um, but we're working collaboratively with, uh, with all our internal operations folks and our technology teams. Um, you, you can tell from listening to uh, Jessica and John and Amber, they've done a, a really good analysis and providing the analytics on, on the expectations of what we can expect, and ultimately that's that's what sets us up in terms of running our day ahead market and getting things uh, aligned well so we can be successful in real time. If we can get to the next slide, please. So Amber covered um, quite a bit of this already, but, but I will touch on some things and to make sure that I answer those questions about ramp capacity and also outage coordination. Um, but let's start looking at the slide. We have kind of our, our pre-day ahead activities. Um, this is, these are things that are starting now, uh, but, but they ask, you know, they really ramp up when we get closer into that day plus seven horizon where, like Amber and, and Jeff had mentioned, you know, our, our weather forecasts, now we're starting to hone in on some pretty good weather forecasts. We can, can uh, simulate that in our day ahead. Um, the key there is is making sure that our, our solar resources we're getting uh, you know, the self schedules and and bids in there in the day ahead. And what we want to do is we we want to test out um, based off of uh, resources that we have available in our day ahead. So there there could be some force outages on some generation resources. There could be some force outages on transmission. But we can start simulating in that day ahead market um, based off of what we're expecting for that solar eclipse period, and we can be looking at our um, resource commitments, and we'll probably commit some additional uh, resources to make sure we have sufficient uh, like traditional generation available to help with charging, because as Amber mentioned, we have, I believe our battery fleet now is right around between 5,000 and 5,500 megawatts of, of capacity, so a lot more than what we had in in 2017, so that's a great tool to have, but now we need to make sure that we're positioned well in the day ahead market and in the simulation exercise to, to ensure that we, we have the right charging and discharging timeframes to align with that eclipse period. But the, with those um, minimum state of charge tools, uh, we got end of hour state of charge in the day ahead, 
then we can do some things in, in real real time as well to make sure those are positioned where we need them to be uh, so we can manage that to, that ramp change during the eclipse. Um, Amber also mentioned that, you know, with hydro, we'll, we'll be coordinating as well with some of our pump storage facilities, making sure that we have, you know, the flexibility that we have with, with those resources. Um, we have good ramp capability out of those. Um, so we'll be doing a lot of coordination ahead of time. And that's in that pre day ahead, you see the, the WEC RC coordination, Tim Beach, the director of RC West, he's already got uh, meetings set up. I believe those start the week of the 18th of this month, um, where we, we'll do, he'll do some coordination with, at the RC level. Um, Dave, myself, um, John, and Michael will be doing coordination with the IOUs. Um, Starting next week, we hope a lot of those folks are on this stakeholder call, so we can dig a little deeper um, next week into setups and and questions and, and iron out any any concerns. Um, the scheduling coordinator act interaction is going to be going to be really important. Again, that gets into making sure that our day ahead uh, schedules and bids are accurate and match what we're going to expect to see with those obscuration rates. Um, and again, when we get into that D plus seven horizon to October 14th, the day ahead markets open seven days in advance of that trade date. So we can start, we can really do these, these internal market simulations with scheduling coordinators uh, submitting their bids and their self schedules. We can run those market simulation. And if there's any feedbacks that are needed to those scheduling coordinators, we can do that and it can be an iterative process where we're, we're basically copying that 10 14 trade date into our non production environment. Um, and then we, again, that feedback mechanism can ha happen with the FCs and we can true up, make sure that those bids and schedules are accurately reflective of, of our anticipated impacts. Um, gas supply coordination, that's going to be important as well for our thermal fleet. Uh, we'll make sure that the because that's going to going to look a lot different than a typical day where we're we're going to be ramping the ther thermal generation. Um, we're going to need probably some additional thermal generation on beforehand to get our batteries fully in that neighborhood of 50 to 70 percent charge before we start seeing the the eclipse impact. Um, so we'll do some gas coordination there as well. Now, getting into the coordination, so I think that question came, I'm trying to look back at the, the, the comments. Oh, that came from Mark from Calpine. So, Mark, we, Amber had mentioned that, you know, we'll, we'll start looking at our messages that are scheduled in and around that, you know, the 10, 14 trade date. Um, and I'll talk with you more about this offline. There's a potential that we might do that restricted maintenance operations just to ensure that we have uh, maximizing our, our BA resources, both generation and transmission. So um, we'll we'll discuss that more internally, um, and when, there's a chance that we might issue that RMO uh, for that trade date, 10:14, on those specific hours. You know, probably like a 0600 to like 1300 time frame something like that, but that's something that we're going to continue to discuss internally and with our PTO partners as well. Um, Amber talked about the assistance energy transfer and, and for those um, that may not clearly understand what that is, that's the, the, the WEIM transfers, those are dynamic transfers between uh, WEIM participants um, and participants have the capability to opt in for this assistance energy transfer and what that means is if if a WEIM entity um, fails, fails a resource efficiency evaluation uh, the flex range test or, or I'm sorry the flex ramp test and the bid range capacity test if you if you fail those and you weren't opted in then your your transfer capability can be limited when you're opting in it basically allows for that uh, that WEAM transfer to occur without limitation, but there is there's an additional cost associated with that. Um, but again, um, it does give you additional transfer capability. So that's something that the ISO will more than likely opt in for for 1014 is, is to have that AET turned on. Um, I've talked about the, the RMO declaration. So 
we'll, we'll be considering that. The 48 hour rock, that's essentially just our, you know, two days in advance of the trade date. Um, we'll be, we'll be running the, the day ahead market, actually a 72 hour, we'll be running the day three for sure, um, where we can start looking at resources, outages, what our, you know, and then when we're in that time frame, our forecast is going to be pretty, pretty darn good. It's going to get better as we get closer to that actual trade date. And that three day, day look is going to uh, provide some good feedback on how we're set up for, for uh, ramp capacity and just general capacity. Um, the day plus two conference bridge, that's something that um, Dave and I and, and Michael will, will We'll set up a, a call where we just we're basically going to talk about those day ahead results um, from uh, at least a minimum of 48 hours prior to that trade date, maybe 72 hours, but for sure on that day plus two, have a call, talk about the anticipated conditions, outages, resources, and any 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 changes that we might need to uh, or adjustments that we may need to make in preparation for that 1014 trade date. Um, bottom two, mainly for ISO, we got the, we'll have some crew training, and that's going to be more of a tabletop exercise and, and providing them a guide of the tools that we'll have um, used in the day ahead, plus tools that they have available in real time. Um, again, a lot of those tools have to do with exceptional dispatches, the minimum state of charge, those type of things that we can make adjustments as needed in real time. The uh, MNS messaging that we'll be doing pretty much in the uh, day plus seven horizon all the way up in, into the actual trade day MNS, the market notification system. Those notifications are available on Oasis. They get published there as well on the market participant portal. And so I'll, in a couple of slides, I'll show some of the templates that we'll be sending on those uh, MNS messages. Um, I think we've, I'm looking at the day ahead activities column because a lot of that's, uh, I think I've covered a, a, a chunk of this, the reserves and AS procurement. AS procurement is going to be ex, uh, very, very important. And Amber and her STF team are, are really key to op operations in terms of our day ahead setup. They provide us uh, the analytics to support, you know, based up the forecast, really derive what we need from a, uh, regulation up and regulation down and our reserves. Um, so we'll, we'll get that analytical information from them. Th those are inputs into the day ahead market, but you can rest assured that we will have um, a, a lot more additional uh, up and break down to, to help uh, in real time. Uh, Roughnet Short is the tool where we can connect additional resources. I mentioned this earlier where um, this will be a consideration based off of operational conditions and the weather forecast once we're in that time where we can commit additional resources. And this, this could be especially important for charging those batteries in kind of the non-traditional times that we that we usually charge and, and discharge. Um, we've already talked about minimum state of charge. So there'll be a post day ahead conference bridge, just like in that blue section where we talked about the day plus two conference. We'll have a uh, post day ahead conference bridge just to, again, share those day ahead results and be prepared to make any real time adjustments. Um, the Amber already talked about the flex alert. Um, again, our flex alerts are driven from infeasibilities in the market um, and the day ahead market. So if, if, if we did have any infeasibilities, then we would consider that. But as she indicated, uh, with those loads that we're anticipating, I, I doubt will be infeasible, uh, feasible as an energy capacity and feasibility. So we're more worried about the, our flex ramp concerns on, on 1014. Then shifting to real time, um, real time tools that we have um, or that we plan on utilizing. Number one, we'll tighten our AGC bands. This will, uh, this will allow our AGC to dispatch a, you know, regulation up down resources um, a little tighter to manage uh, area control error. So our uh, load and supplier are a little t tighter balance to stay, stay finer tuned in that sense. I've mentioned exceptional dispatch. That's a market mechanism where we can uh, exceptionally dispatch resources um, to either stay at a, at a level or, or start them up, but 
again, a tool that we can use in real time to improve our ramp capacity, improve our charging capability and discharge capability. Um, we talked about album transfers and FRP. Um, also, prohibit test energy. So this would be one thing that we we want to avoid on uh, the eclipse period and probably the shoulder hours into the eclipse period is we don't want to have have or allow uh, test energy resources. Um, a lot of times those resources they're they're not necessarily in a, a market dispatch, so they can be um, counterproductive uh, for what we're trying to achieve in this eclipse period. So that would be one thing that we, we want to avoid during the eclipse. And then uh, solar resources, the operating instruction for solar resources is not to exceed bot. Um, this should be bold, highlighted, and emphasized greatly. Uh, so this is going to be super important for us in real time that uh, our, all of our resources, and solar especially on this day, that they should not be um, producing as capable on the when the ramp when the obscuration hits the maximum and now that sun's starting to shine a little more we don't want those solar resources just to um, produce as capable we want them to follow their dispatch operating target instruction and ads that's going to be very very critical um, because that, that's good our market is is assuming these ramp rates right so it, it it's it's a lot of movement in generation and traditional generation and bird generation so it, I, I want to reemphasize that again, that uh, we really want to make sure that our solar resources are, are not exceeding their dot, following the dot, um, super important. Uh, also for real time, uh, we'll have some additional operators on staff. Uh, my, myself, I, I'm up for the real time market operations. We'll have an additional operator available to help support. I know Dave is planning on having some additional VA operators as well. So. We'll have folks uh, in addition to the technology support teams to be supporting that. And then you can see in real time, we'll we'll have some additional messaging. We had MNS messaging in the pre day ahead and the day ahead. In real time, we'll in addition to MNS messages, we'll be getting messages out via ADS uh, for all the market participants to see, as well as Everbridge. Everbridge is what the RTMOs uh, send out to all our WEIM entities. Um, quick comment, I see, will ADS automatically issue the OI to follow the dot to solar resources when the eclipse begins leaving? It will, it will not automatically issue the OI. Um, you'll, you'll see the, the, the gen dispatchers at the ISO will, will send out those, or will, they'll basically set up ADS to, to ensure that that OI instruction is, is sent. Um, so from a recipient from a client side from ADS, yes, those those things will be put in place ahead of time. And messages will go out. I'm gonna cover the message templates and there's a, a, a reference to the OI piece on that. All right, um, I think that's it for this slide. Next slide, please. I think we've covered um, a lot of this. I apologize, I think we've touched on the RC West, but this talks about the, a lot of our coordination plans with uh, RC customers, uh, Jason BAs and WEAM participants, the gas companies, IOUs and market participants. I think a lot of this is covered. I think for the WEAM participants, one thing that I do want to um, highlight there is, you know, there have been questions in the past, hey, do we want to lock ETSRs or limit ETSRs? And and the, the answer is, is, is no. And as Amber described earlier, with the with the ge geographic diversity that we have within all the WIM entities, um, areas are gonna be impacted at different times. So the ability to share um, resources dynamically in a five minute market is gonna be super beneficial, um, not just to, to the Cal ISO BA, but to all the WEIM BAs as well. So, so the, what we'll be discussing with them in the biweekly ops meeting coming up is yeah, we want to leave our ETSRs unlocked. Um, don't do any additional limitations unless they have some uh, reliability uh, concern. Obviously, they would they would do that in those circumstances. And last slide, please.
this last slide is just an example of the MNS messages. These will be tweaked um, a little bit. I, there's some, um, you'll, you'll notice on the top one, we'll start sending daily messages on October 11th. Um, so that'll be the Monday preceding the, I'm sorry, looking at the wrong month myself. October 11th will be the, um, the Wednesday prior to the, to the eclipse on Saturday. So starting then, we'll start sending out some daily messages just as reminders. Um, and then the morning of, early morning of the, the eclipse date, we'll, we'll start getting some more detailed information um, out in the notifications and, and so forth. So I won't read through each of those templates, but the, the, the purpose of this slide is to, is to illustrate that we plan on doing a lot of communication via MNS. Um, and then once we get into the real-time trade date, we'll have uh, ADS messages and Everbridge messages as well. So I think we're getting a little bit short on time, so I'm going to pause here and make sure we address any questions that haven't already been answered. We do have a hand raised. Um, Patrick Lacey, go ahead. DOTs, I mean, I'm, obviously I don't know about other entities, but a lot of our solar resources are not AGC enabled um, and they're pretty much just must take gen. So, I mean, in that scenario, I mean, we don't really have a choice but to take whatever ramp they provide as the eclipse starts to fade. So, I mean, what should an entity do? do in that case because there's there's no real way to hit a dispatch target on a lot of those sites yeah so on the i think to the the emphasis on that was on the at the maximum obscuration point to when the and to the point to where the we start getting increased sunlight on the on the for the solar that they should be they should be following dot there should the dot shouldn't be going beyond the your ramp capability. Now you, in in the master file we have we have ramp capabilities and, and and I think historically we've actually you know solar has the ability to really increase quickly and we've put some specific ramp rates in there that our AGC and EMS systems can manage. Um, so so the DOTs are going to be based off of that master file ramp rate and that's what we're asking to to not exceed. Right, and those so those dispatch signals should be what you're. It, if you're producing less because you're not getting the, the the fuel of the sun, that's that's fine. What we're saying is if, if you have if you have the capability to do more, we're asking you don't do that. Don't produce as capable, to, but to stay locked into that dispatch operating target. Does that help? Not really. I mean, that's that's my point. A lot of our resources are not AGC enabled. We like they obviously get a DOT, but it's not like where the site is limiting to the DOT or operating to the DOT. It's operating wherever it gets to based off of irradiance at that point, because especially a lot of the older sites, dispatchability wasn't part of the project plan. So, like, in that case, if at the point of maximum obscuration, we're getting a DOT for 5 megawatts, and then all of a sudden it starts producing 7, we have no way to control that on some of our sites. So, that's what I'm more so concerned about. Hey, Patrick, this is Dave Delphart. We can uh, take this up with you offline if you'd like later, if you want to... Um set something up, I can give you a number. I'll put it in the chat. Sure. And there's added, this is Amber, there's added details into the paper. We haven't mentioned the paper yet. Both the presentation and the paper are posted publicly on the miscellaneous stakeholder area of the website. Um, Caitlin can put the links in to the chat for everybody to receive them. But in, in the paper, there's a lot of details also about each one of the market mechanisms that we have talked about. And it is really critical, I think this is the most important point, it is really critical that the solar forecasts that are being submitted capture 
what's going to happen with the obscuration for each and every site based on their location to the percent obscuration that they get. And then on top of it, it's really critical that those forecasts you're able to meet the, the dispatch operating target and you're able to linear ramp between the DOP, the dispatch operating point to the dispatch operating point. Because as we talked about with the ramps, we think the toolbox is there to handle this. The nice benefit to this versus a partly cloudy day is that we do have a lot of ability to see this in a seven day horizon. We can plan for it. We can use some of these tools in the toolbox, but the most important tool is to have that forecast submitted from the providers that are providing the forecast to the best accuracy for the obscuration that's going to occur. That might be harder in October than it was in August because of the fact that we do have more clouds in the October timeframe, but we really need those forecasts to be there so that the resources on the return can hit those dispatch operating targets and that they can ramp between their DOP, their dispatch operating points. Um, but I think we can cover some of this, Patrick, in, in, in some of the offline conversations, and I know that that Dave will put that out there too, but that is really critical and we did highlight that also in the paper as, as we're preparing. Okay. We also had a um, question in the chat from Dennis Sismate with NCPA. Will ADS automatically issue the OI to follow the DOT to the solar resources when the eclipse begins leaving? Kaylin, I think I answered that earlier. So, um, if there's still additional questions around that, but the, in essence, the answer was no, it's not automatic. It's, not, it's done by our um, generation dispatchers, but you can count on that those, those OI instructions will be sent to the solar resources. Okay, yeah, and I see Dennis, I think, uh, added a follow-up question here. If, um, if a solar resource is still undergoing testing as a new resource and has not achieved COD, should the resource shut down during the last two hours until the eclipse clears? Yeah, and I think hopefully I addressed that one earlier also with test energy. We're, um, we're planning to disallow any test energy throughout the eclipse period. And then we had another question in the chat from Michael Volk with pg &E. The MSOC is being phased out on 9.30. How will this tool be utilized in October? So this is Michael Martin. I can, I can, answer, I can answer that one. You, you're correct, the, the MSOC is uh, um, will be uh, phased out. It is still in effect for, um, I think, till the end of this, till June of 2024, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's unlikely that the MSOC would be engaged because it would rely on a rock and feasibility, which um, Brian discussed, we, we generally will have on its capacity, it's more of a ramping issue. Um, I think in the paper we described this a little bit more and we also say that that is unlikely that it would be engaged. Does, does that help answer the question? And, and maybe to, to further that, just if there's um, you know, state of charge and, and getting our battery fleet uh, positioned where we want it is we, in post day ahead and in the real time, once the day ahead is actually published, right? Let's say on Friday, the 13th, uh-oh, um, the day ahead publishes at 1300. Now that real time market opens up and we, we can at that point uh, get, use a, the D tool for, for batteries and make sure that we have them positioned. Um, and again, we're we're gonna gonna use that internal market simulation to really help us to gauge that. But I but I think looking at the a lot of the data that Amber and team have there, we're looking.
looking at the, you know, probably in that 0730 time frame on the 14th, where we we want our battery fleet almost in the middle, maybe a little bit uh, as far as state of charge, or or maybe slightly above, and that 50 to you know 65 percent um, charging from state of charge, and then we have the flexibility uh, through that eclipse period where we can be charging. So we have that availability or that tool uh, available to us in real time post day ahead. Michael, I see your hand raised. Um, can we open up the line, please? Thanks. Can you hear me? Great. Yeah, I was just wondering, you know, in real time, how you're going to position the batteries without the exceptional dispatch to hold the state of charge. So, will it be a traditional ED? I think, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, but the end of our state of charge that we're talking about going away on the, on 9:30 is the that's the basically the the day had post day tool, right? When we when we're rough and feasible. We still have the E D tool within real time for the batteries where we can do where we can hold state of charge or have a minimum state of charge. Is that correct? So so we understand we've always had the ability to hold uh yeah to the quick thought to to exceptionally dispatch for of a system reliability need and, and, and hold the resource, even a gas resource, I suppose. Um, what this new hold SOC might be referring to some enhancements is some uh, settlement enhancements coming along with the uh, hold SOC instruction. Um, I think the, the spirit of the, the, the hope is not to be issuing you know, a bunch of holding or EDs, exceptional dispatch during this event. We, we're focusing more on, on the preparation side. Right. And I think I got a, a comment from Dave too that I think may help on this is um, the minimum state of charge that. Uh, that that retirement or that tool, that process on 930 is, is WEIM wide. But we, I think what, what we're saying here is for ISOBA, we, we have a tool that allows us to do EDs to, for the batteries to position them as desired. Okay, but that'll be on a resource by resource basis, right? I mean, the, my understanding was that the fleet wide Exceptional dispatch to hold state of charge is not going to be functional until uh, fall release. Yeah, this this tool in house a lot. I mean, it's not built into the market per se. You know, it's a it's a tool that uh, basically allows you to do a, a fleet wide. Um, so it's, it's something that our generation dispatchers can utilize that, that does to get us to where we're probably headed with the market software in the future. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Sure. All right, well, I think that's all we have for questions at this time. All right, well, just to do a, a quick, I think this is the last slide on the operational side. Before we go into the timeline uh, of the different activities that are out there, I wanted to do a, a bit of a recap. I know this is a lot of information, uh, a significant amount of numbers um, of load moving around and solar moving around and ramp rates and all of those different things and, and, and really, kind of hone in on the take home messages for the group and we really appreciate all the attendees today um, is, you know, compared to the 2017 eclipse, 
um, we do have a rapid growth in both the KISO and the WEIM footprint on grid scale um, solar as well as behind the meter solar, making this eclipse on a megawatt perspective and a ramp perspective larger than the 2017 eclipse, even though it is an annular eclipse versus a totality eclipse. Um, that's out there and, and really, um, you know, you're going to see ramp rates overall um, throughout the different eclipse on the net load of an average of an up 122 megawatts per minute and, and decreasing by, you know, 190 megawatts per minute on the return with the return um, being the fastest ramp rate on the system um, going out of the eclipse back to normal solar production. Um, Brian and team and, and, and the rest of the KAIS and the technology team, really there's a lot of tools in the toolbox to be able to utilize. We have the blessing that this is going to be forecasted in the forward direction. Um, so a lot of collaborations are going to occur from here all the way until the eclipse time period on October 14th, which is a Saturday. So when you're, you're seeing extra crews and things um, on the KISO planning side, also something to think about from your guys' side, depending on what is needed. Um, this is a Saturday event where the last one was during the weekday. But you'll see those coordination meetings out there. there there's a stakeholder comment period um, as well coming up, and we're happy to take any comments that you have, and we'll utilize a lot of the procedures that were in the 2017 Eclipse, as well as some of these added ones um, that we've talked about today with the AET opt-ins, um, the WEIM transfers were used in 2017, but now it's 22 entities um, to be able to um, harness the ramp that's happening. And then in addition to that, we have a lot of battery resources on the fleet that is really different than what we had in the 2017 eclipse. So with that, some extra reserve procurement, FRP, all of the different tools, um, I think that will be well planned for the eclipse overall. Um, and with that, I will pass it back, I think, to Caitlin to go over timeline, next steps to submitting comments. Um, and if there's anything that you guys see um, that would help um, be further elaborated, whether it be in the presentation or the paper, um, we're happy to take that information on. All right, thank you. Next slide, please. Oh, perfect. Um, so again, today uh, we've had our stakeholder call providing an overview of the eclipse. Um, and here on the screen is the timeline. So um, coming up on September 13th, we have the WEIM biweekly ops meeting and IOU coordination discussions. Um, then on the 18th, we'll do the RC West and adjacent RC coordination discussion. Um, and then also on the 19th, the um, RC West real-time working group um, and review of BA COP plans. Uh, and then we're going to have a follow-up stakeholder call on October 2nd. Um, that will be confirmed in a daily briefing notice. Um, October 13th, an RC West webinar with um, RTW members to verify system cluster plans. And then October 14th, um, there will be RC West and RC Coordination Day of early meeting, early morning conference calls, um, and just confirming readiness. Um, so let's move to the next slide. Uh, the presentation for today's meeting and the paper um, can be found on the link there in the first bullet point. Um, if you have any questions or uh, need help with uh, your comments or accessing papers and presentations, you can send your email to ISO, ISO stakeholder affairs at kaiso.com. Um, so again, thank you everybody for joining today's meeting and have a great rest of your day. Thank you and that concludes our conference. We now disconnect.